Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming here to celebrate the book, coming to our little party. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. And I'm so glad. I'm so happy about what I'm hearing so far from people who have read it. Um, yeah, it's, we'll, we'll see, we'll discuss it. And I would love to hear. Um, I know many of you have the book already. Some of you have read it. So if you, um, if you want to share what you've seen or questions you have, or um, just your opinions on it, that would be great. I'd love to hear from people who have read it. I know probably a lot of you haven't read it yet or don't have it yet, um, especially outside of the U.S. It, it is a little bit, uh, a little bit longer there sometimes, although even some people I heard from someone in the U.K. who got it today and, and originally the date was in November. So you never know. They're just pushing them out when they can. Um, but I really appreciate your excitement, your support, and, uh, and just being here to chat about it. So I'm going to say a little bit about the book and why I wrote it and kind of what I want you to want, want everyone to most get from it. Um, and then I'd love to just open it up to questions, conversation. And of course we have some gifts. So we'll be doing a, a couple drawings for some signed books and also some spots in the book club. So uh, let's see. So back in January of 2020, it was a whole different world. If you remember January of 2020, um, I was asked to write a book similar to the little book of big change, uh, but about self-doubt. So I knew that I wouldn't write a book. I, I knew I could write a book that would help with the experience of self-doubt. And I knew that it wouldn't be a book about self-doubt, <laughs> if that makes sense, because self-doubt isn't a thing, you know, there's no, there are no self-doubtful people walking around on earth there. It's not a thing. It's not an affliction. It's not a problem we have. It's not, it's not a thing that's separate and different from anxiety or insecurity or joy or happiness or addiction or depression or anything else. Self-doubt, like all of those things is a thought believed. You know, it's, it's thought arises and we identify with it and we don't even do that. It's not like we say, oh, there's a thought. I'm going to call this mine. It's just how we're conditioned. It's just how it looks, you know, and, and what we've been taught and what we've in some ways evolved to kind of see and how to experience it. So you know, on the one hand, of course, I know I knew I could write something that would help with self-doubt. On the other hand, I had to sort of play along and say, okay, I can do this book about self-doubt, sort of knowing yeah, it's not really about self-doubt. <laughs> it's about anything and everything and all, all experiences the same. And none of us truly have ha our self-doubtful people, our insecure people, or even have these as issues the way our mind would tell us that we do. So we live in this, this constant flow of experience. And in that experience is all kinds of story, all kinds of story, almost always centered around this character called me. And man, we get caught up in that story. We're just, again, everything in us. And I'll talk about this. This is what the book looks at is how we get so easily caught up in that story and why we do not because it's true, not because it's actually about us. None of that, just simply because it's, it's what happens. It's how we're conditioned. It's, it's what we, you know, how we grow up and what we're taught about things and where our attention goes and, and eventually where our identity ends up. So we end up very mind identified or thought identified. And, and to me, what I wanted to share in this book and what I see, what I've seen over many years of talking about this, that's been so helpful. It, it's really an issue of identity in a sense. It's like when, when we're just so tuned in to thought and what our mind is saying and those stories, that's where our identity is. It's where our attention is. And it's sort of all we see. And and as we start to wake up to this and see, see how thought works, see why it's working the way it's working, and there's excellent reason for all of it, 
that we just don't know until we do. So see how it's working, why it's doing what it's doing, see that it isn't personal, see that it isn't as it appears. And really like, as we wake up to that, we start to see, wow, there's more <laughs> like there, like this little conversation in my head is not all there is to life. There's this whole other way of being in the world, this whole other experience that's there all the time and always has been. We're never actually held away from it, but when we feel very identified with our mind and our thinking, it feels as if we're holding distance from life. This is where all of our suffering comes in. It feels as if there's distance from life. We feel disconnected. We have trouble in relationships. We end up in habits and addictions. We feel insecure. We feel self-doubt. And, and what do we do? Because we're already very mind identified. We think, well, these are my problems. I have all these problems, you know, now I'm even more disconnected from life. I need to go fix all these problems. So just in seeing how our mind works in a deeper way starts to just loosen all of that. So that's really, uh, that's really for me, like if I had to think about when I did think about writing this um, and thinking like, okay, what in I have constant conversations about this every single day and have for many years, like, what is it? What's it the, what's the crux of it? Like, what's the most basic helpful thing to start to help people see? There's a lot of ways to answer that question. And I'm not saying like I picked the one. But this is how it looked to me in January of 2020, as I started writing this is like, well, we can look at what's true and we can talk about that indescribable space. So whatever we call it, consciousness, awareness, truth, God, life, innate health, whatever words are all words for the same thing. We can get curious about who and what we really are and what's there beyond this narrative. And we do, and that's amazing. And people get a sense of it. Sometimes people really fall into it. We really touch that space. We start to identify with it more. We start to know that's home and that this is not home, that's home. All of that's beautiful. But what I've seen after having umpteen conversations about this day in and day out for years is people touch that space it does feel like home. It's deeply familiar. And then, and then mind chimes back in thought comes back. Of course it does. <laughs> it's conditioning. It's our conditioning. We've been listening to our heads our entire lives and everybody around us has too. So, so there's so, and the, well, there's a lot in this, in the book and a lot we can talk about, but there's a lot of reason why, of course, thought is going to come back and demand our attention. And that's fine. That's not a problem at all. But what I have heard from people and seen over and over again and experienced myself a lot is like when mind comes back, when thought comes back, it's like, it feels so sticky and personal and real. And it has this way of sort of sucking us in that it, it's very easy. It becomes kind of easy to discount the other stuff we felt. And I hate to even say it like this, like it's a mind or the other stuff. I hope, you know, like every the language does that. It's the only way really to talk about it, just to illustrate, but there's, there's nothing bad about thought. There's nothing wrong with anything that's happening in any of our experiences ever. It's totally perfect. It's just misunderstood. So habitual condition thought comes back. Of course it does and starts talking about you right? It starts saying, well, you need to listen and this is dangerous and that's uncomfortable and you need me and, and look, there's this problem, but don't worry. I have a solution and look, you don't feel well, but don't worry. I have a, you, you know, chase this goal or do this thing and you'll feel better. And that's how it kind of just keeps hooking us back in. And people would say, yeah, but I have to listen to this because it's constantly talking about me. You know, they, when our mind does the things that all minds do, like compare us to other people, uh, try to solve problems that it actually created, uh, overblow and worry and dramatize everything. Again, talk about me, me, me all the time. These are things that literally 
all minds do. Like this is just the human universal experience of being mind identified, of listening to thought. But but what I kept seeing over and over is like, we kind of don't know that even if we know it, when it comes back, it just feels so personal. And again, of course it does. Cause it's been talking to you in first person sort of in your head or what feels like it's in your head, your entire life. And it's telling you all kinds of stuff about your life. So, so of course we listen. So the whole point of this book, just a thought is to is to really start to show like, Hey, this is just how it goes for all of us. Because I know that when people start to feel like, Oh, that, yeah, it's telling me all these problems with myself and comparing me to all these people. And it's talking about my health and my kids and my finances and all of that, but I'm onto it. I'm onto it. I know that sounds so simple, but honestly, I'm onto it. I know that's how a machine talks. It's evolutionary it's conditioned, it's mechanical, it is not personal. What it says is not personal. And even that we can talk about all day, every day, but until we start to insightfully see that, it just doesn't go very far. So what I'm trying to do in this book is to help us see, hey, there's good reason for everything that happens. Your brain works the way your brain works for excellent reason it's just misunderstood. And when it's misunderstood, of course, we're going to listen and tune in and get very identified. But when we start to understand it, like, oh, it's just a machine trying to help me. It's not as it appears. Then we naturally kind of lose interest in a sense. We're less hooked. We're not listening for what do you need to tell me next? Because we know that we don't need anything that it's telling us. We start to naturally fall back into I don't know, I don't like these words, but what you might call who we are or our true identity or something much, much bigger beyond this, this little habitual machine-like stuff. And that's, that's really what starts to change everything. It just starts to really, uh, kind of, uh, kind of the scales tip We're, we're less in all this and what feels like it's, uh, holding distance from life. And, and we're in something far bigger and that infinite consciousness that we all know, that we all know is there, that's calling to us all the time. It becomes more real when we're just less caught up in what our mind is saying. So that's sort of the point. That's, uh, that's what, what my, I guess, uh, hope was as I was writing this. And, and I do that in, in a lot of ways we talk about in the book, I talk about in the book, uh, getting attuned to this narrator voice that we have in our head, which isn't always a voice, by the way, it's pictures, it's all sensory uh, reflections of sensory data, but we get kind of attuned to it because again, we've been, it's been talking to us. We've been living in this our entire lives. So we're really kind of blind and deaf to it for the most part until we sort of notice, oh my gosh, yeah, (laughs) this is here narrating everything and talking. So, so we take a closer look at that, how that's working look at, at why we're so mind identified, why we're so thought identified and when that started. And again, it's all so absolutely perfect. We're these little babies born into this, this sense of oneness, this true, deeper feeling of oneness. And then we have these machines called brains that start to develop and stuff starts to happen in our life. And we feel threatened and the machine is there to help us. So something scary happens and the machine says, "Ah, I'll fix this for you. Listen to me and I'll get you out of this mess. And that's the beginning of it. And we're listening to our minds and trusting it and putting all our faith in it and thinking that we need to listen to it in order to make it through life. So we look at how that all works. We look at how uh, our mind creates our identity because truly so much of why this feels, why our our thinking feels so personal is because it's always talking about us. Of course, it feels personal. We are the center of its universe. It is always talking about you, 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 me, me, me all the time. And what's really crazy to see is that that same mind that's always talking about you and me created this idea of you and me. So we look at that a little bit and see how that's all playing out. When this sense of, 
when this sense of you being this solid person that needs to survive in this physical world and needs to do all these things and think a bunch of things through in order to be okay, like that is the illusion. That it, and that's the illusion that we all again are just conditioned into innocently. And it's and it's fine. When we start to see how that all happens, it's not even a problem that that happens. It's happening for our for our benefit. We just want to, we just want to explore it and wake up to it, you know, and start to see around that a little bit. So we look at that whole identity piece in the book. I tell a lot of stories about people I've worked with where or just people who have, have sort of woken up to this and seen more around it and just how, uh, I don't know, it's so, it's so easy to see sometimes that in other people, especially that, oh my gosh, that's not you, you know, think about anyone you really love, like a, a child, a niece or a nephew or a child who, who is thinking, oh, I'm just not good enough and no one likes me and I should be different. And you're looking at that little human being saying, are you kidding me? You are absolutely perfect. You're just living in this helmet of thinking that says you're not okay. We all have had those experiences with other people and it's true for every single one of us all the time. I mean, there is absolutely nothing wrong. There's just thought believed. It's just a thought that it's believed and identified with. And so we just start to see that and it starts to break up. So I talk, tell a lot of stories. I talk about a lot of uh, my experience with this. So ways that my brain jumped in and my thinking looked really personal to protect me from things in the past and how that plays out and how it still shows up today, but looks very different. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of little stories. I, what I, one thing I love about this book is that it's, uh, it's 31, I think chapters that are very short. So it's very kind of easy to read, um, easy to get through in that way. And I guess, you know, just what I most want people to get from this is your brain loves you so much there. It's just misunderstood. There's no enemy here. Thought is not the enemy our, our mind or our brain is not the enemy. There's absolutely no enemy. There's just, there's nothing to fight. We just want to see how it's all working and a little bit behind the scenes of why it's doing what it's doing. And it brings such a softness and such a, like, Oh, I can just stop the fight. I don't need to fix anything. I don't need to change anything. I can just let go of the fight. Everything's okay. And I have a mind over here talking about problems. Like, can you imagine that? I mean, that's truly like, it's amazing. Everything's okay. And I have an experience as a human being quite often that things aren't okay, but I know what's true. You know, the sun doesn't actually rise. And we have experiences all the time as human beings of the sun rising but we know what's true. There's such a safety in being able to feel anything that comes your way. Think any thoughts that come your way, look right at them. Not like, oh no, that's just a thought. I can't, I don't need to pay attention to that. If it's just a thought, why the heck not pay attention to it? Like, the, like there's just nothing to fear, nothing to fix, nothing is wrong. And that's what I, that's what I most want people to have even just a little, little sense of because a tiny, glimmer of that opens up and it goes so far and it just, it just allows us to just be in life. And when we're being in life, we get to be in the fullness of life. Again, we're not in this little, um, this, this little narration of life so much. We're not just identified with what a mind is saying that's there, but, but we see so much bigger, so much around it. And yeah, experience that there's no words to describe it, but, um, but I know you, I know, you know, it, I know we've all felt it. Well, maybe I'll, um, go to some questions. So, or comments or anything you want to share. So there's some hands up, which I'll go to. Um, so yeah, anything at all that you want to ask or share. And again, I'm totally an open book. So you can ask about, the writing process, the book itself, anything I just said, whatever, whatever's on your mind. Um, let's go to Elizabeth. Hi. 
Hi. Hi. I have a new headset. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. So nice to see you. Great. Congratulations on your new book. Thank you. I'm in Oslo, Norway, by the way. So. Oh, great. You're all the way across. Ah, uh, I have something I've been wondering about. I don't know what you have to say about it, but I have sort of learned not to make decisions when I'm in a very bad mood. I've learned that, <laughs> um, which is great. But when I'm in a good mood, when things seem when things seem seem uh, exciting. And I get ideas like, wow, yeah, I could do that. I could do that. Um, I'm afraid to make commitments when I'm in a very bad, uh, very good mood. Because I know maybe I'll regret it. Maybe this is a bad idea after all. Do you have something to say about that? I do. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so see if you can sense you know, I, I use this a lot. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but I use this a lot to, to look at like how our mind, it just gives such a feeling. And this little friend makes an appearance in chapter one of the book, by the way, but it just gives such a, a feel for like, oh yeah, that's kind of what's happening up there. Right. And, and Elizabeth, when you talk about it, this, it's like, well, if I'm in a good mood, I'll do this and a bad mood, I'll do that. I'm afraid to do this. I don't want to make a decision. What about a commitment? you kind of get the feel and you're, everybody has this, right? You're so not alone in this, but like how, how there's a lot of thought and your mind is just helping you work the whole thing out. So it says, so your mind loves you, your brain loves you so much thought. We've been paying attention to this because it looks so important because listen, I mean, it, it is, it's like, Hey, if you make the wrong decision, bad stuff might happen. And then, and then Elizabeth might be in danger or like, this is what our brain has evolved to do, to keep us safe, to keep us alive. And so we've looked there so much and we just give it all this power to talk and talk and talk as if it's helping us make good decisions. But I want you to consider that none of that, not, nothing that you just said, none of this, this, if this, then that stuff that your mind talks about has anything to do with the decisions that are made. What if you, every single one of us, we just do what occurs to us to do. Life makes decisions. Life moves us forward. Life lives us. And we have a mind that we're very identified with that loves to talk about it, that loves to take credit for it. And sometimes try to try to dodge the blame for it. So your mind is up there saying, okay, Elizabeth, here's what we're going to do. If this, then that, and this, and that, and then you'll be happy everyone's mind does that. Every single mind on earth does that. Mm. But what if that is just a conversation and it has yeah, nothing I mean, to do with your life or your happiness or any of that? What if what we call commitments is only a concept? Well, it is right. Cause you can't, Maybe it's a where's a commitment? We made it up. Yeah. It's a thought. It's just yeah. a thought. It's a concept we made up and now it's a thing except it's huh. not really a thing. Except <laughs> it feels it's like a thing. Exactly. That's what a mind does. That's what a brain does. Yeah. It thingifies everything yeah. because yeah. It, its whole job, again, it is one very simple job is to keep you physically alive, but it, yeah. it, it extends that a bit and it says, well, let's keep her safe and let's try to keep her happy. And now it starts talking and talking. And we, from a very early age, start listening. So, right. So it needs that certainty. It's always looking to call things a thing. It uses language and labels. And it says, there's a thing called commitment. Yeah. There's a thing called regret. There's a thing called right and wrong. Yeah. There's a thing called a good mood, a thing called a bad mood. And, I, and don't worry, I'm going to help you work it all out. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Yes, I, I had a little aha moment. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank good you. Question. Monique. Hi, Amy. Can you hear me? Hi. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay. I'm so excited. I, um, I'm being asked in my practicum to do a, a group project with some students and they want me to do stuff on self-esteem and, and, um, 
self-doubt and I was like oh gosh what should I do and then and then the book showed up <laughs> and so I might I might chat with you about how I might um, put together a little group project for some students so that would be fun um, but you may have actually just answered my question because um, it was along the lines of you know you, you started out saying you know our minds start thinking about things and it attributes it to us and that's just what happens and um, I think a, a lot of kind of what I get is people saying, well, if that's what happens, that's what should happen. And, you know, the thoughts produce, you know, feelings and then we act on them and it creates behavior in the world. And that's kind of how it, anything in the world happens. And so um, it almost sounds sometimes like when I talk about it, it almost sounds like I'm saying, you know, don't ever believe your thoughts. Like, you know, like don't, don't pay attention to that at all. And, um, and, and people get a little confused. So you may have touched on it a little bit just with that, but it's like, how do people make decisions or no? And I, I get sometimes, you know, people will say, um, you know, listening to my thoughts is what got me out of trouble. It's what has helped me and saved me. And so why would I not do that? That just seems like, yeah. you know, going against, you know, and the other thing that happens too sometimes is that people get into situations where they they react like, it seems like, so I'm going to say it seems like without thought. So they, you know, like somebody says something and they react violently or whatever. And then like psychologists sit them down and say, well, you're going to need to sit and think about this longer before you, you know, act on it. And so they're actually trying to teach them how to, how to think in the moment <laughs> instead of how to unthink in the moment. So it's kind of interesting in that, in that regard. And I just wanted to know what you what you say about about that yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit complicated sorry no it's okay well I guess it just it just it it it's the fact that it sounds and feels complicated I think shows us that we don't need to work all that out you're right these mm -hmm. are all theories that that we come up with to explain our behavior you know mm -hmm. and I think when uh, I think it's curious to look at like when it when we're hearing or thinking oh well thought helped me here so I need to listen to it like, right. where's that coming from? Probably more thought, right? <laughs> like, like mm -hmm. probably a mind that wants to stay employed and stay in charge of everything or seemingly in charge of everything is like, oh, look, I helped you over here and I helped you over there. Like you need, you need me. And I mean, I don't know. It doesn't look like, like we need thought to me, but I think it's an awesome thing for us all to just look at ourselves, you know, like really play it. Like what if, mm -hmm. what if, our brain evolved and, and it, and it had in our mind and all of that, it has so many hooks and it keeps us listening. It talks about us. It talks about time. It promised, it promises to solve problems. It does all that mm -hmm. as its attempt to just keep us in there and keep us listening. But what if we truly can live life without being so identified with it? That's it. Like, and, and just put it as like a, what if question. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's a cool thing for us to just explore on our own. You know, do I mm -hmm. really need this? Does it really help me the way it says it does? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found myself that it absolutely doesn't. <laughs> so I see it really clearly. It just that a lot of people are, you know, oh, but I need to think in order to, you know, act. And so um, I think that, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. And especially the thing about, you know, trying to teach people to think before they act, you know, um, so is it, it are, is it that you feel that when people are not so much paying attention to their thoughts, they will actually act in what's more in service to them or what's more helpful to them in the moment? I think we just do what we see to do. I wouldn't even yeah. put it, make it that complicated. You know, I think yeah. we just do yeah. what we see to do and then bam, there's a new moment. So mm -hmm. even in that, in which is a really common question, there's this, there's this desire to like, okay, how do I make my life the best it can be? Should I sit mm -hmm. and think? Should I not sit and think? That's all this. Oh yeah. You know? you see what I mean? So it's yeah. like, we just do. And, and I know that sometimes when, especially when we're, we're listening to this our whole lives, that can feel really scary and really like potentially irresponsible and like, oh my gosh, like you, like you mentioned, like, I'm just going to haul off and hit someone or whatever. And it, <laughs> it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't seem to happen that way. That's what our mind tells us will happen. It just doesn't seem to happen that way. We just yeah. do what we do. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely see that. That is what a mind would say. Yeah. Yep. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Horatio. Hi. Hi. Hello. I would like to make a commitment. And what I will do is um, I use a translator because my English is not very good. I am from Argentina. Some of you may already know me or have heard about me. And it's good to see you and thank you for giving us this chance to be here. And thanks for for your book. Um, I read the previous ones and and I really love them. Thank you. It's true, it's really true. Uh, I just wanted to make a commitment about what you were saying about that person who is beyond, beyond thoughts. Um, just a while ago, I was talking to some friends about this subject. And I was telling them that it never ceases to amaze me how vulnerable and variable is our personality, our ego. Because I was telling them that yesterday I had a slight fever and that completely changed my way of being. I felt bad and I uh, in a low C mood Mm -hmm. and everything looked black and troubled. And today, when I feel healthy, I see everything fine. So I say it again, it, it never ceases to amaze me how changeable we can be. And that gives me the guideline and the proof that we are not really that. Because how can we be something that changed so much? Yeah. It gives me the, the proof that we are that which is, is beyond our thinking, beyond our ego, beyond our personality. That which does not change. The fact that just one degree of difference in my body, one degree of temperature can change me so much. Give me the guidance that it can be that. We can't be so fluctuating. Yeah. It's that's amazing to see, isn't it? And you and I can feel like you really see that. It's like, wow, one degree <laughs> and everything yeah. feels different. It looks different, you know, and how funny that we go around so identified with how we think and feel and how the world looks as if it's true. And then we see, I love that you're seeing that. See, once we start just seeing like you're onto it, so you're going to notice how thought has these different reflections. And when it does, you have a completely different life and you're a different person or no person sometimes. And, (laughs) you know, like, I mean, that's amazing. Once we get onto it a little bit, you start seeing it everywhere. And then sometimes, you know, mind will come in and say, like, oh, well, that's just because you were sick and now you're better. So of course, you know, it'll, it'll always try to kind of, kind of bring that back in, but you're so onto it. We know what's really going on. We just see through this filter. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Perfect English, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ramakrishnan. Hello, Dr. Amy. Uh- Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Actually, I'm from UAE. I I, I didn't get the book here yet, but anyway, I hope that I will get the book soon. Uh, Thank you for giving me uh, this opportunity. My clarification is that uh, how can we identify the uh, difference between the insight, uh, which is coming from our true identity and uh, the thoughts which are coming from our uh, mind, external mind or mind, how can we identify that? Uh, 
because uh, you you have actually one time replied me that all all insights are not from mind uh, something can be uh, getting from uh, we can get from uh, our true identity our inner self uh, so how, how can we differentiate that well some of I'm the go ahead uh, no, yeah check. in chat box also some person asked like uh, intuition as compared with thought maybe similar question i think so if you give some advice on that it will be helpful to many people yeah yeah <laughs> yes. well, i think um i don't know i'll just share how it looks to me like well, i don't think we have to distinguish mm. and identify we can cuz see these are all concepts and ideas these are more thoughts to say that there's something called intuition and then there's something and now I'm not saying I don't use those words and that everybody doesn't use those words because we use language and we divide things up and this is how we communicate but what I what I want you to kind of kind of see is when we back up really truly at, at the core there's no it's we just feel life and then our mind comes in and says oh that was intuition I like it this one was personal thought I don't like it or whatever <laughs> you know and so so if we can if we can start to kind of zoom out a little bit back up a little bit and see it more as this oneness that shows up that yes we experience the we experience it chopped up and with names and labels and all of that because that's what a mind does I write about that in the book like this is just what a mind does it tries to name and label it, it names and labels and buckets everything because it's trying to know it's trying to know like you're saying like i need to know what intuition is i need to know what that is but it's an interesting question why do we need to know why does it feel to you i don't mean to put you on the spot but i'm just curious if anything comes up why does it feel to you like it's important to know the difference between intuition and other thought uh then uh we can know that we are doing the right thing correct uh suppose uh for example i i i uh, one of our spiritual gurus in our uh, ancient tamil nadu i am from tamil nadu uh, south india of uh, south india it's a state from the south india uh, we have a yogi uh, which is name uh, whose name is vallala he said that uh he will do even a simple, simple action action from his from his own inner self in a, uh, from the god inside himself so even if you want to visit on friend or any person outside uh, if uh, they call him to come there then uh, he told in his letter that uh, i didn't get the uh, answer from in, inside from the god inside so i am not able to come right now so i will come later once i get the permission from the uh, from inner god uh, kind of answer he is giving so what is that uh, can you uh, have any idea about that i think you'd have to ask your guru that because honestly i don't know like i that doesn't that doesn't resonate with me so i don't but i don't know i don't want to speak for for your teacher you know ask your teacher what he means by that to me all i can say is like i think when we're thinking about is it this is it that just like you said i want to know if i'm doing the right thing usually behind us feeling like we need to know or wanting to know which bucket something falls into is is more thought that says there's a right and wrong here and there's a me who could do it wrong and there's a me who could do it right and if i do it wrong i'm going to have a really bad life and if i do it right i'm going to have a wonderful life all of that is thought all of it all the way down oh, okay uh, i understood that but uh, to do uh, okay it's right or wrong concept but to, to do the right, correct action uh, do we need to have some thought some uh, thought to proceed with the action uh, because for the situation do we need to have uh, any correct thought to uh, proceed with the action because every action uh, uh, shall need to have some uh, uh, base thought correct without thought we cannot do something right is it possible yeah. any without any thought we can do anything sorry say that last part again uh without thought can we do some action uh, without any thought can we do any action 
to proceed with some action for the uh, situation yeah we need to have it seems like thought thought is everything so thought it doesn't just precede action it is action like it like again the way i see it is like it's just it's all it's all one thing it's all sort of life living us now now again it even if we said okay yes you have to have the right thought to have the right action or whatever like it doesn't look to me like we have any say in what thought shows up so so if we have to have the right one well i don't i don't love that because where do i find the right one what if I get the wrong one? Do you see what I mean? It starts to starts to get a mind churning. It's kind of the definition of this mind identification that I was talking about. What if life just lives us? And I'll just leave it with that. Like I, I think, sure, there's probably thought there, but even if if and when there is, we we're not in charge of it. We're not pulling the strings on it. We're not making it show up. So it's so helpful to kind of see there's this whole thinking and the if this then that and all of that stuff that shows up for every human on earth and that as we can see oh this is just what that machine in my head does i don't need to listen to it so much it doesn't mean you shun it it doesn't mean it's a problem it's not a problem at all it's just like oh i don't need to try to jump in the middle of this river and find my way out i'm not going to jump in the quicksand and run really fast and hope i get out you get to kind of just let it do what it's doing. And, and I know that sounds very vague, but you just let it do what it's doing and, and things show up and life lives us. Oh, uh, yes. Yummy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I got, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Katie. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi Katie. Yeah. Hi, Amy. How are um, you? I'm all right. How are you? I'm good. Um, I've just got a general question of um, why it's almost like why does it keep happening? Um, so, like at the moment, you know, I've just I've sort of I've had a day of being stuck in my head, but I've, I've been swimming. And as I, as I was swimming, I just found myself back in peace. Um, and it's almost, I keep asking myself, when it goes the other way and I'm, I'm back up in my thoughts again, it's, you, it's just this sort of, why does it keep happening? Um, because instantly that I feel that um, I'm in the wrong frame of mind, um, straight away I jump in with oh it's just thoughts they don't mean anything they'll pass and I almost feel like that is it's almost like a, a voice coming in that's trying to soothe me and calm my, calm me down yeah. but it it surely that's that's not right either because that's more thought where when when I feel at peace and I'm not anxious, there are no thoughts. You're just living life in the moment. Um, yeah. And that's the bit that frustrates me because as soon as I, I sense, you know, life happens, something happens, it triggers me again. And then I'm, I'm instantly coming in with all those thoughts. Um, and it's almost, oh, what, what are all the things I've got to remember? Yeah. Oh, it's this, this, this. Yeah. Um, and it just drives me mad. <laughs> well that that's the question katie i mean that's the thing why it happens it's just it's just a mind doing what it's designed to do it happens like it, it is literally the design it happens because you're a human being and you have a working brain the the part that's creating the suffering for you is that is that there's a thought and it's just a thought but it's a it's one that you've been carrying around for a little while that most of us carry around that says this shouldn't be happening mm. And I, and I know, this, you know, the struggle is in the, um, the suffering is in the resistance. And yeah. right at the start, you, you, did you say, um, well, it's just a thought. Why, why, why wouldn't you listen to it? Yeah. So it's almost like I'm trying not to listen to it, but, right. but at the same time, I'm trying not to resist it. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's such a paradox because I feel like I probably spent years saying like, 
well, it's just a thought. You don't, you don't have to listen to that as if we have a choice, but you know, just to illustrate a point, like, well, you don't have to listen to that. And then I think, of course, naturally what we hear is like, don't listen, don't listen. <laughs> and, and now I want to say, I want to shout from the rooftops, just listen, who cares? It's just a thought. Yeah. You see what I mean? So it was never like, yeah. oh, it's just a thought. Don't listen. That doesn't even make sense. If it's just a thought, why not listen? Why not invite it in or listen or don't listen? You know, really, because of, cause you're seeing why you're seeing what happens when we start thinking, oh no, this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be here. Yeah. It, it, uh, it's very much, it's, it's sort of walking a fine line really, isn't it? Because it's, um, I mean, what, what's just come to mind you saying that is the, um, the little poem by, is it Rumi? The guest house. Mm-hmm. so you know invite it they're all visitors whatever visitor shows up invite them in because yeah. because there's you know there's there's a purpose there's a reason for them to, to be there yeah um but at the same time you, you're sort of fighting with yourself because um you, you're, you're thinking I'm, I'm like you know i'm instantly putting these thoughts in my head to say oh, it's okay, it's, it's all right, it's just a thought, you know, you don't have to pay any attention to it, and you'll, you'll feel differently, and this sort of thing, so it's, it is this fight that starts going on. Yeah, but see, even that, Katie, you're not putting those thoughts in your head, you're not do how, you're not doing that, like, where do you go find them, where do you pull them out from, and, and put them into, you know, like, the, those are just thoughts that are showing up, too, so yeah. see if you can just back up a bit from all of it and see, wow, isn't this interesting? My, I'm, I, there's not a lot of thought I'm in life and then thought pipes up and it's talking and then it's followed by, by more thought that's trying to calm it and quiet it. And, and you, you get to see that whole thing play out. Like you're the awareness of, within which all of this is just happening. So you don't need to get in, in any of that. You don't have to pick a side. You're not doing any of it. It's just what's happening. That's what starts to shift your, your identity. Do you see what I mean? You see what I mean? When we're, when we're thought identified, it's like, oh no, why this and why that? Because it all feels very personal and like we're doing it. You're not doing any of it. You're just noticing it. So as time goes on, that, that just reduces presumably and you just think, oh, there it is again. And then you just move on more quickly. Yeah. And it, I don't know if the time has anything to do with it. Like, I mean, you just, when we start to see it for what it is, it, it doesn't necessarily take time, but, but like, just even what I just said, like when we see, wow, this is, this has nothing to do with me. It's just the whole cycle mm. playing out. That's it. it. It just seems to be that it comes with, with a pressure where I'm sort of trying to make myself think, oh, that's all it is. Oh, you, you know, yeah. It's, and the, it's like, and it's the not pressure. That- yeah, the pressure's thought too. I just want you to see. So all of this, it's all the part that says, I can't believe I'm doing this. The part that says, this doesn't feel good. The part that says, Ooh, now I feel better. Thoughts gone. It's all thought. It's all, right. the, it's all the same thing. Yeah. yeah. I know yeah, it, no, it, it can take yeah. a minute, but sit with that. Like it's all the same thing. We are, we are just swimming in it our entire lives and to start to see oh look at that that's it too it's it's huge yeah that's perfect thank you amy yeah thanks thank you all right we'll go to a few more questions then maybe i'll uh do a drawing for a couple a couple presents uh iphone don't have your name there Hi, are you talking to me? I am. Yeah. Oh, hi. hi Nick. First of all, I want to uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to talk to me about my granddaughter. But you know what happened? Something happened in my in my phone, and all my messages became sender unknown. So I have like three hundred messages, and I have to go through each single one to respond because I don't know who sent them. Do, do you remember me? Yeah. Well, oh, sorry about your phone. Yeah, so I haven't been able to respond to any messages that, that I wanted to tell you. But what I wanted to say, you know, I'm very new to this uh, philosophy of thought. As you know, I, I got uh, referred to by Laurel. And so I just started reading a couple of things that you've written and stuff. Uh, but what comes to mind is 
See, I am currently uh, also writing a book, and my book was basically trying to get people who aren't um, uh, familiar with meditating to meditate. So my book started out on meditation, but through the course of writing it, it's very odd because what you're saying literally came to me on my own was that thoughts, random thoughts that we put a lot of credence on are just that, they're just thoughts. And so the reason I came to that conclusion, because I'm, I'm old, of course, and I tried to start meditating when I was in my 20s, and that was in the early 70s, where you could, if you weren't in that circle, you couldn't find uh, resources to teach you how to meditate. So for many, many years, I thought I was doing it wrong because, because I didn't, I, I couldn't quiet my mind. Mm -hmm. So what I wound up doing was naming those thoughts and I named them. I know this is gonna sound silly to most people, but what I named them were chupacabras because chupacabras is a myth in Latin America of a creature, a mystical creature that sucks all the life force out of animals. And that's what I felt those thoughts were doing to me. They were taking my life force because anytime I, I was trying to be at peace or meditate, I would have the most awful list of thoughts like horrible thoughts. And I was like, why do I have these thoughts? So what I did was I named them. And then every time they came into my mind, I would say simply, chupacabras be gone. And then I even evolved further. And I would say this little mantra, chupacabras are like dark clouds in the sky. They pass by, just acknowledge them for what they are and bid them goodbye so most of my thoughts are fear and anxiety so i would simply say that's just my fear and anxiety and let it go and this has helped me tremendously like i heard some people asking you well you know how do you know if it's not a, a valid thought or or an invalid thought or a premonition that that's exactly how i used to think well what if this horrible thought is something that's going to happen but what it is it's there if it's, if it, it's very simple. If there's a negative thought, it is fear, anxiety, or anger. If it's not a negative thought, it's a wish. And that's fine too. But all we have is this moment. So I understand exactly what you're saying. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And, and, and my book is actually um, get rid of your chupacabras, change your energy, change your, your, your thoughts, and change your life because that's exactly what it does. When you stop thinking those things, just you get negativity out of your mind. And so I want to thank you one for talking to me about Aaliyah, which really did help me. And I'm trying to decide with my son what we're going to do. And number two for your work, because you seem to have uh, been able to put it in a way that a lot of people can understand. I don't know if I've been able to do that in my book that I haven't finished. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. Okay. So I'm going to go to Michelle Saunders, but I want to speak to, um, to some things in the chat uh, questions. What do you do with thought then? Um, how, then how do you action? How do you do action? How do you make choices if you can't use thought? So I mean, again, it's a read the book. It's a it's a bigger conversation, but I don't think there's anything we do have to do with thought. We'll listen to it, and sometimes we won't. You'll call it chupacabra, or you won't. You'll see it as helpful. You'll fight it, or you won't. It it, it doesn't matter. It's got a life of its own. It's here. It comes to life. It goes, and and it's not you. It's not the totality of of life experience. So I think this is what we've all been told and taught. Like we've just, we're so conditioned in this, you know, again, it's me, it's my thought, and it's up to me to do something about it. And very ironically, it's thought telling us that. So it's our mind saying, what am I going to do with myself? <laughs> you better figure it out, you know? And I just want you to see if you can kind of step outside all of that. There's nothing to do. We don't, you know, children are, are fine. They, they don't come out. They don't, they're not born knowing what to do with thought. They simply just aren't afraid of it. They haven't made up or heard the stories about it being a problem and all of that. And so it just comes and goes. 
So there's nothing we have to do and making choices and action. Again, I, I, I don't, you see what feels right to you in this, each of you, because it, it don't listen to me or believe me, but it doesn't look to me like something we manage either. Now I know we have the experience of choosing. We, we have the experience of, I picked up the teeth right now because I decided I was going to use this to show you. I didn't, I don't know how I made that happen. <laughs> Even if I chose to pick up the teeth, I don't know how I can't explain it. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do when this calls over. I can tell you maybe what's on my list to do next. I have no clue what's going to happen. So, so just play with that for yourselves and see, and, and, and it's worth looking at. It can be a little freaky sometimes, you know, like, really, we're not in charge of anything. Our mind can, and it's our mind doing it. We'll take that and run it in a whole different direction. And that's okay. Sometimes that's just part of our, our seeing process, but look for yourself and see, because it really starts to open up so much. If, if we just live in a sea of thought, that's wonderful and beautiful, and it's not a problem. And we don't need to be so closely identified with it. And it can be there. It's doing what it's doing. And life is living us. That's really what, as we, when you read the book, you'll see, I mean, I, I talk about the good reason behind everything our brain does. It's trying to keep us alive and it needs certainty that needs to know. So that's why it uses language and labels and categories to no, 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 no. And what it's, why it's doing that is trying to predict the future so that it can keep us alive. So it's like the autocorrect on your phone. You start to type in a word and it finishes a word with something totally inappropriate. And you're like, well, that's not right. That's not what I meant to say, but it's just a machine trying to figure out something it doesn't know yet. Our brain works the exact same way. You know, it's just a machine saying, Oh, here's what happens for people like you, or, oh yeah, there comes those thought, thoughts again after your nice quiet swim. You know what that means? It's filling in blanks and it's doing it in a, it's sacrificing accuracy because it's accuracy is not its goal. Survival is its goal. So it fills in blanks. It makes up stories it, that are all about you. It connects dots that have no business being connected <laughs> because it's a, because it's a machine and that's what the machine is designed to do. And I talk about it in the book with stories, with science, with studies that talk about this. Um, and you really kind of start to see, oh, okay. Like not that we're going to come away from this book being, you know, brain experts, but you, you really, I hope have this feeling of, oh, okay. So there is no problem here. It's just doing what it needs to do. And, and I've had more thought thinking that I, there's more on me, you know, like I'm supposed to be managing this. I'm supposed to be running my own life, but that's, that's what a mind would say. Okay. Um, Michelle Saunders. Can you unmute Michelle? Hi, Amy. Can you hear me now? Yep. Hi. Okay, thanks so much. And I know that we're coming to the end of the time. I love what you said. What if life just lives us? And someone in the chat just wrote about breath. And that was a, so I haven't finished the book or, you know, I just started your book and I can't wait to read the whole thing. But I'm wondering if you talk about that in the book, because if life just lives us, just like we just breathe. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you're talking about here? Just be, don't analyze, don't, don't label, don't think, just be, and it will just happen. Is that kind of what you're talking about? <laughs> it is. And it's, it's even simpler. <laughs> so okay. even, and I know these are just your words. This is just, a, we have to use all these words to describe things, but okay. it's exactly what I'm talking about. And you don't have to just be, you don't have an option. You don't have a choice and you don't have to not analyze because you have a machine in your head that will analyze that is never going to stop. I mean, you, you may stop listening to it. You may stop thinking it's you, but as long as you're alive, you have a brain that's going to analyze. So it's, it's what you said, and it's infinitely simpler. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Michelle, other Michelle. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I, I'm, 
I'm just hoping that you could speak into my situation to help it click a little bit more. So the way I got led to you was I battled with a binge eating disorder for many years. I'm much better with that now. However, I find I still have a huge tie to the scale. Like I want to get on it every morning and kind of let it tell me good, bad, or indifferent. And the books help me, but I still feel like something needs to click. And I was hoping that maybe you could speak something to me that would help facilitate that. What do you think, like, what do you think needs to click? I mean, so it sounds like you, I don't know, you know, that thought is telling you that the scale is going to somehow do something. So I like say more about how that looks to you. Uh, I think it's more an issue of how do I go from maybe it's head versus heart. Like I know, and I want to do it this way. And I, I want to not have thought in the way. And yeah. then there's that other part of me that's like, yeah, but this is, this is how you function. And this is how, you know, everything's okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? I feel like maybe it's a head yeah. versus heart thing. If I had to describe it. Well, no, I love that. That's, that's exactly it. But it's only, it's only head versus heart because of, because of the misunderstanding we all have about how our mind talks. So exactly what you said is like the perfect illustration, like, well, you need this and you really should. And so when you start to see, as you start to see, that is what all minds would say. It's literally a computer in your head, trying to keep you safe in only the way it knows how, which has nothing to do with the scale nothing to do with your, you or your weight or your habit or any of that. You don't need any of that for protection. You don't need any of what your mind is telling you to do to feel good. None of that. But we think we do. That's what we're all up against. You know, like we think we do because we've been listening to it for so long. So I could say that all day. It's not going to do a whole lot, but as you start to insightfully see, Oh, I, I get this. I see why my mind is doing some of the stuff it's doing. It thinks it's helping me. And as we start to see, like, it's not an enemy. It's not a head versus heart in a, in a pit them against each other way. Is it like heart's better? No, head's beautiful. Our head tries to protect our heart. We just take it so seriously. We just identify with the head and we throw the heart away, you know, and, mm. and that's where things kind of get off track. So I'd say it's really just as you, as all of us, really kind of come to see how that machine's working and how thought works. I don't know. I mean, it sounds so simple when I say it this way, but honestly, it just looks different. It just falls away because it just looks so different. Yeah. And so much about identification really, really rings true with me. I could see where I'm identifying in ways that are trying to help me, but isn't really being helpful. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Cool. Thanks. Cool. So I can take some more questions. I'm happy to, um, but let me, let me uh, draw some names. We have a really cool, I found this awesome number picker online that I'm going to select some winners who are going to get a free seat in the book club and uh, a couple copies of the book signed. Um, the only bad thing about the number picker is it takes a little, it takes like too long, <laughs> but it's okay. So it's, it's kind of dramatic. So, uh, I'm going to share my screen in a second and we can do that. So let me first, before I do that, tell you what you're winning. So um, the book club is a six week exploration of the book with me and with some of my change coaches. So basically starting in uh, the middle of October, we'll read the book together over six weeks. I have it divided into six sections. You can read it beforehand. That's great, but we'll read it together. And then I've created a video that goes with every chapter in the book that kind of uh, takes it a little deeper, pulls out what I think is the main ideas there. Um, and then, so you'll watch that. And then every Tuesday for the six weeks, uh, we'll get together and we'll just discuss it. I'll do some coaching similar to this, answer questions, really help make it clear and concrete and help it come to life for you in a way that's meaningful. Because again, it's not about believing what I say or just getting it intellectually, but really trying to help it kind of come to life for you. So we'll do that once a week. And then there'll be another, another meeting with a very small group that'll be led by some of my change coaches. So those groups are awesome. They'll be um, I don't know, maybe 20 to 30 people at the most, maybe even smaller. And the change coaches will lead them. They're not recorded or anything. They're just an opportunity to, to talk about this stuff uh, in, a, in another way. So that's kind of what the book club is. 
Um, and I'd love for you guys to join me in that, but I'm going to give away five seats to people who were, uh, RSVP for this party. So, um, so Nipper, what's, what's our top number? 593. 593. Okay. So let me see how I do this. Uh oh, okay. So let me share my screen. I think I have to do that first. Can you give me the ability to share my screen, Nipper? Um, yeah, let me see what I did. Me and Nipper have matching rooms. So like <laughs> we, have, we have the same interior designer. Uh, let's see. Can I, if I make you co-host, will it do it? It, it that should. That might work. Okay, let's do that. No, it still said host. Oh, hold on. Let me try it again. Okay, let me uh, make this look cooler. All right, can you guys see that? You see a big wheel? Yep. It's gonna be very dramatic. Okay, so we're gonna, it's gonna pick a number between 100 or between one and 593 or whatever Nipper just said. And that will be the winner, one winner of a free seat in the book club. <laughs> just spends like about three seconds longer than I wish it did, but. That's okay. Number 80. All right. All right. Who's number 80? Number 80 is Lori. And it's we have several Lori's. So um, I think it's Cristiano. And we'll email you. All right. So Lori Cristiano. Yay, you'll be in the book club. Um so yeah, you these you may may or may not be live on the call, but yeah, we'll email everyone. All right, let's um, let's do a couple more while we're here. Forty six. All these low numbers. That's good. It's getting people that that RSVP'd early. Ah, huh, let's see. Oh my gosh. There. Are you getting all the hard to pronounce names? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ellen Sonde. Oh, I know Ellen. Yay. Cool. All right. Let's keep going. So, and, and if you've joined the book club and rolled for the book club already, then, then you can either give your seat away um, or we'll give you a refund and you can still do it for free. Um, what did I do? Done? Yeah. One ninety one. All right. Uh, Christiane. And I don't have a last name, but it's the only Christiane that has signed up. All right. Awesome. Christiane. All right. I'm going to do two more for the, for the book clubs. Then I think maybe we do the book separate. I can do those off, but we can just email people. <laughs> Oh, Ooh, 567. We just signed up. Uh, it is, it's a Karen and she has Chanel in her email. I don't have a last name and we have a lot of Karens that signed up. So whoever has Karen Chanel, Chanel in her email. All right. Awesome. Okay. Is that three or four? I think that was four. All right. One more. Oh. Oh no, what is that? I think it's a commercial, so <laughs> we're an ad, not a commercial, an ad. Oh no, hold on. Um, 
Oh, wait, now I have to share my screen again. Okay. Okay, last one. Good one. <laughs> Uh, Catherine Komnenos. All I right. Have, I may have slaughtered that, but I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's. <laughs> I used to do this all the time. Every time I had little school big change, I'd have my kids pick a name out of a hat. We spent hours literally writing every number, and then had, it was very fun and dramatic. But every single time, it would be a name I couldn't pronounce. But so, sorry, Nipper. But awesome. Well, cool. Five of you. We'll be in touch. And then I will do three more that will just totally randomly. I'll do this. Uh, I just don't want to put you through three more of those. Uh, but I'll be sending you a signed uh, paperback copy of the book anywhere in the world that you live. So excited to see where those are going. So Tammy, and, and by the way, um, yeah, I'm happy to take a few more questions. Um, so go ahead and put your hands up if you have them. Go ahead, Tammy. Hi, Amy. I'm so excited. I can't, I haven't actually received the book yet, so I'm really looking forward to it. But, you know, I've been following you for a while, so you're kind of preaching to the choir on this. So I sort of have a, it's not really a question, I guess it's a comment, but I wanted to, I'll, I'll comment very quickly because it ties into this comment to Michelle, um, who just spoke about the scale, because, you know, I joined your program having this issue with overeating. And I would come on week after week and I'd want to know why and I'd want to know what can I do about it and how is my brain looking for the solution and all these things. And as you may recall from the podcast we did that in the end, what occurred to me was it wasn't the, um, well, am I going to do, should I do this, should I do that, should I just let the thought pass, strategies. In the end, I came to the conclusion, and this is the one that stuck, and it was clear as day, that I never actually had an overeating problem. I just thought I did. So I was always chasing solutions to, a, I was having thoughts about the thought, and it was this one big, massive mess that I couldn't get out of because there was nothing to solve even though it felt like there was. So I don't know if that's useful, but the, the question or the comment that I had for you today is that I don't think you're suggesting, and I guess this is for you to confirm or not, you're not suggesting that we don't ever use our brain to consider our options when we're actually facing a situation where we have to decide on an option. I think you're suggesting that all the thinking around it can um, can get cumbersome and and can be um, a little elusive, I guess, an illusion like my eating quote problem was, because clearly we sometimes have to face with three options and we need to pick one and move on with our business. But anyway, you, you could respond to that. Yeah, I think um, I think like you're saying, you know, like we we feel when we're just spinning when there's, it just, when it feels confusing, when it feels like it's all on us and we better pick the right option. Like sometimes it's really clear to see, well, my mind is really making this into something. It feels personal. It's all, it's full of concepts of right and wrong and better this and better that and all, you know, so sometimes we feel that and sometimes we don't feel that that much, but I think, you know, I think our, our brain is a awesome machine that keeps us alive and, and maybe has some role in decision-making. But, but what's really cool is to see, like, it's not on us to try to figure all that out and have it spit out the right solution, you know, like, just like you saw, like you, we spin around and like all these things that look like problems and then look like potential fixes. And then sometimes we just pop out of that all together. It's not that we find the right solution. We pop out of it all together and we're like, oh, that was a dog chasing its tail. And I think that's what most of our thinking is. Does that answer your question? So it doesn't, again, it's never, it's not wrong. There's no problem in any of it. Um, it's just good to see it a little bit more for what it is. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to clear up. You're not saying never use your brain when you're faced with legitimate options. Like I have to choose door one or two, just like go with like, don't, 
overthink it. Don't create a problem where there's not one. Yeah. I mean, and even if I were to say, don't use your brain, could you do that? Like, it just seems like we, we do, we do what we do, you know, like, no, I'm not really, I'm not saying that, but I'm also not saying use your brain. Like I, it's, it's kind of bigger than all that, you know, it's like, see how this, this is working on your, for your behalf. It's working for you and life is living us. And we, something amazing and semi-magical feeling happens when we see how this is all playing out. And, and we just start to see, wow, I'm not steering this whole thing. It's just playing out and I can see it and, and things pop out and decisions are made and choices are made. And sometimes regret is felt and sometimes relief is felt and it's all okay. It's all sort of part of this, this experience of life. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's, uh, you know, in the, in the book, and I know many of you have probably heard my podcast, recent podcast episodes where I talk about, uh, there were five of them, I think about what minds do when they correspond with chapters in the book of seeing like, wow, there is a perfectly, uh, valid and sensical reason why our mind worries all the time. Now worry on the face of it, it's, it's our imagination. It's literally the definition of worry is thinking about something that's not real. It is literally your imagination. It doesn't seem like that would make any sense. And understandably, we could say, what's wrong with me? Why do I worry so much? This doesn't make sense. It does nothing but make me feel bad. Of course we can. We've all been there. And when you start to see, no, worry makes perfect sense. We've evolved to worry. Worry is a mind saying what might happen because 200,000 years ago, our ancestors' mind said what might happen and it kept them alive. So now our brains have to say what might happen. There's no mistakes. There's no problems. We just don't see that. We just don't see the full picture, you know, same with comparison, are we, we go out in the world and we think, oh, she's better than me in this. And I don't stack up here. And, and our mind is constantly doing that. And it can feel so personal and real, but when we start to see, oh no, that's just a brain trying to gather more information. It's trying to bolster this identity that it created for us. And it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time and a lot of attention, a lot of energy goes into that happening. But when we can kind of pop out of it in a sense, you know, we see what's happening from a different place. It just, it just looks different. So I talk about that with comparison, with problem solving, our minds are always looking for problems, creating problems so that they have something to solve. And that sounds crazy, (laughs) but I bet if you look in your experience, you'll see how that's the case. I don't know if anyone else has this, but my mind loves to get up in the morning and doesn't do it as much anymore, but still scan for like, okay, what might happen? It used to do it constantly. It would wake up with this, this horrible dread and anxiety with my mind proactively trying to help me think about all the bad things that might happen that day so that it could prevent them so that I could be happy. How messed up is that? Like how backward is that? Right. But that's just, it makes perfect sense when we see what a brain's job is and how our mind does it. And then how we just innocently get caught up in it. So there's so many, so many things like this. And I'd say everything, obviously I don't address everything in the book, but everything that's going on. What if, what if everything that's going on in life, everything that's going on in our experience is absolutely perfect. There's not a problem. There's not a mistake. There's not a flaw in any of it. You know, it's just, it's just misunderstood. Cool. Any other, I see, um, I see your hand up Ramakrishnan. I just want to see if anyone who hasn't asked a question yet has any, I'm I'm happy to speak to. Uh, I think Ellen, Ellen actually has a question. Okay. Hi, Ellen. Hello, and thank you very much. I'm uh, the lucky winner. Yes, Yes, yay. (laughs) Super happy. 
<laughs> I didn't uh, really have a question. I just wanted to uh, say something about the thoughts. I've been in this understanding for a couple of years and I have understood the words uh, that I'm reading and, and listening to, but uh, the reason why I joined this understanding uh, the first time was because of my uh, problems with sleeping. And I still have those, but uh, this uh, time when I woke up at five o'clock uh, in the morning, I, I felt very calm and happy. Normally I get very stressed when I wake up that early. And uh, when I went, went out and had, had a shower and uh, come, uh, yeah, the day started, I normally tell myself the old story that, oh, this is going to be a day like, oh, it's going to be so awful. I'm so tired. I'm not going to uh, be able to make anything out of this day. And that uh, old story started to play in my head. And then suddenly, well, this is only a story. And it was, uh, <laughs> I, I knew it uh, in advance, but it was like uh, lightning in my head. And this day has been super. And I've done so many things and I've just been in the moment and the thoughts, I've been uh, smiling at them. And yeah, that's what, the main thing I wanted to see, because to me, that was great. It was so different from reading and, uh, I don't know what word to use, but uh, the main thing is that I really understood this now, the story that's always playing in the background. It's only a story. Yeah. I don't need to listen to it. I can smile at it or I can do whatever, but this day has been perfect without sleep nearly who knew it's amazing yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing I mean that's exactly how it is when we and see when I even say when we wake up to it sometimes we'll hear that as like oh I wake up to all thought and I never feel bad again and that's definitely not what I'm saying it's not it's like what exactly what Ellen's saying like in a moment when we see oh that's literally a story that I am mm. believing and feeling it as if it's true because that because we feel what we think yeah then, then that's our reality. And when you see it, you pop out of it. And that experience is possible for all of us all the time. We, and we, and we won't be there all the time and that's fine too, but you, that's cool. Well, it's uh, really, <laughs> I'm smiling and so happy uh, without sleep. I can't believe it's true. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you yeah. very much, Amy. Cool. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> I'll see you in the book club. Yeah. <laughs> um martin hi amy hi. very nice to, very nice to have this chance to talk to you again yeah you too can, can i uh, take it on a slightly different tack because at the beginning you mentioned that you were actually asked to write this book so it brought a number of thoughts to mind one being would you be writing books if you weren't asked to another thought that came to my mind was um, did you have a problem in determining the scope of the book? I mean, did the publisher say, well, we need 190 pages? Um, did you or did you just feel that after 190 pages or whatever it is precisely, you felt that that was enough? Um, another thought was, does it leave a lot of scope for further books? I mean, have you... Do you feel that with what you've said here, you've covered essentially what, you know, the, the three principles cover? Um, so do you, do you feel enthused in a way maybe to continue and, and do something further? Or uh, I can actually imagine writing a book is pretty hard work and maybe you might be just enjoying the, the sigh of relief that the process is over for now and you certainly don't want to think about consider considering going through it again yeah so, so any no, great, yeah great questions I, lo I love these um so I would be writing books if I weren't asked to I mean I might not have written this one in this way at that time exactly but it was I, I had 
I had been working mm -hmm. on some stuff. So I, uh, I was ready and, and, uh, I already like my next book better than this one, <laughs> the one that isn't written yet. <laughs> so of the books I've right. written, this is my favorite and I don't like it as much as the next one that I'm going to write. Something weird happens and this may not be weird. I think this is probably, uh, probably pretty common. Um, when I go through, again, tell me if others feel this or notice this, if you write or create, when I go through the process of writing a book, um, almost, it feels like almost every time, as soon as I'm done, I instantly look back and don't see things the same way anymore. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, I don't, and I love that. That's awesome. Right. I mean, it for sure brings up a little thinking of like, oh man, I wish I would said it differently, but, but I just write another one at some point. So I think there's something about maybe, and I'm making this up, but it feels like maybe there's something about going through that big process that leads you, that kind of helps you see things even deeper, uh, that feels like it sort of pushes to a new level of clarity so that, yeah, I'm, I kind of can't wait to get the next one out. You froze. I don't know if you're still with us. So anyway, I think, uh, I think you froze for a minute, Martin, but, oh, there you are. Are you back? Yeah, yeah, I'm on my cell phone and the quality is a bit bad. Um, yes. So, so absolutely, I have uh, not said yeah, everything there is to say. <laughs> not even close, not even close, not even scratching the surface of what there is to say. Or right. what there is okay. to see, you know, because I, all of us can only share as far as we sort of see. And, I, and there's no way that I'm anywhere near the end. Oh, well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Anyway, I'm looking forward very much to, to reading the book and, and um, coming back to you with the comment cool. and feedback. Good. Thank okay. you. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, Jojo. Hi, Amy. It's Joanne. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. This was so great today. Thank you so much, Amy. I feel like you have an extraordinary amount of patience to like continue, you know, when you get it, then you don't get it. And so you, you hold that space so well. I feel like today was such a light bulb moment. I, I loved this. I wasn't even expecting this and you can't, you at first we were at the um, oil change. Then you came to get my nails done. <laughs> now I'm back in my car. You've been everywhere today and I've been listening the entire time. And I totally just something clicked. So thank you so much. Well, that's what you wanted, Joanne. So you got your wish, right? I know, but I wasn't See? expecting it. So I'm really just so grateful. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I don't know what the next book's about, Monique. I'm, I'm assuming it's about the same thing all of my books are about, which is not really about anything. <laughs> just a, just more, uh, I don't know, more of the indescribable, trying to describe the, the indescribable. But I think and hope, and already it feels like it in, in maybe a deeper, clearer way. I mean, I think that like, how, how amazing are, is it that we can keep seeing things? Like that's when I first started to explore some of this stuff it just completely blew my mind that there were people that had been teaching this stuff and sharing this stuff their entire lives and they were still super into it and they were still seeing more and more and seeing things more simply and more deeply every single day and I was like yeah I want that you know and that's I just think like, how, how lucky are we, you know, and I'm not just talking about people who share this. I mean, all of us, like there's no, end, there's no end to the, the extent to which we can kind of feel that oneness and that truth and, and see our mind doing what it does and know that is not our identity. That's not us. And, and sometimes we just get these little glimpses that keep us going and keep us exploring. And other times, uh, we fall into that glimpse and it feels a little more semi-permanent perhaps. And that's amazing too, but I just want everyone to feel hopeful and know that that's possible. And it's not about getting somewhere again, even with our minds talking, everything's absolutely perfect. We just, we just understandably don't see it. 
So thank you guys so much for being here. I'm happy to answer more questions. Uh, send them to my email if you want, or however you want to get in touch with me. Um, and I'd love to see you in the book club. It's, it's an opportunity to do this uh, for a while, but in a really deep way, kind of getting really juicy into the content of the book. And like I said, really kind of helping it, it come to life for you. So thanks so much for celebrating with me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all your support and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye everyone. Congratulations, Amy. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.